Hello, everybody. Welcome, everybody, to the 52nd edition of Vision Durel International Film Festival in Neon, Switzerland. We are in the middle of the festival, the third day. I am very happy to be here with Natalia Almada presenting her film. Hello, Natalia. Hello. Thank you for taking users in uh, our international competition. Oh, we're, we're thrilled. Thank you. Uh, we are online and distance. Uh, some of the people around here in Switzerland and in Neon uh, can still come and see the, the movie in, in, in theater. But uh, thank you again for being with us even on the other side uh, of, uh, of the ocean. Uh, the film will be available for 72 hours, as well as our chat will be available also for the entire festival, so don't hesitate to, um, to of course, enjoy the movie and have a look also or listen what we are saying. <laughs> um, Natalia, can you tell us uh, what has been the origin and what has been the trigger for you to start uh, this movie? Um, yeah, I think it's, you know, it's a lot of things that come together for me, I think, to make this film, but I always, I think the most significant one is having kids that I was so afraid of my career and what was gonna happen and would I keep making movies <laughs> and, I thought about it a lot and I thought, well, having children is kind of this big change. And most for me, creative time comes from change. And so um, how can I think about being a mother and the change changes in that way, it changes the way I see the world as a kind of inspiration and impetus for the film. So it's not that I wanted to make a film about my kids or about being a mother exactly, but rather taking that kind of life experience and using it creatively. So um, for me, I think having the kids just made me think about the future differently. And I was constantly up against, you know, pretty banal questions like, do you use screens with your kids? And if you do uh, what and when and where and how much, right? Or there's this um, smart crib that is supposed to be fantastic, right? And put your kid to sleep, like, do you, do you use it or do you not? And all these questions, you know, and, and you can think back to like, should you use formula or breast milk? And is it wrong to use formula or is it right to use formula? Like, they're such small questions, but they, I think as a parent with a baby, first child, you you kind of, if you think about it, it's like you, it's a bit of an existential question if you allow yourself to go there. Right? It's not just formula or breast milk. It, it's a much bigger question or, or it opens the door to a bigger question. So I think that was kind of the, the, the energy or the frame of mind that led me to the film. And then my partners from San Francisco, Dave Cerf, who did the sound design and the score and mm -hmm. being in San Francisco, kind of in the middle of the tech world here having children here <laughs> the you know that that added a lot to it and how did you once once uh, this uh, once this idea came up uh, how did you proceed with the research and what have been uh, your your guides in uh, in the filming yeah my process with all my films and this one even more so is very organic. So I kind of shoot and I edit and I research and it sort of evolves um, through the process. So I, of course, was reading a lot. Um, for example, Neil Postman was a very significant um, research uh, that I was doing, just thinking about how technology um, over time, thinking about unintended consequences, uh, there's a woman named Sherry Turkle who wrote a book called Alone Together and Reclaiming Conversation and thinking about how technology affects our way of being and who we are. And kind of for me, for the first time, not just thinking about devices or the market or um, not thinking about technology, just my own consumption, but rather a kind of more theoretical philosophical view. So I was doing a lot of reading and then uh, you know, just visual research, like what kind of visual language that I want the film to exist in. Mm -hmm. And what, how you came up with the, with the language that the film is adopting, because uh, there is a, like a, even in the most dreadful moment or uh, when you're evoking a situation that uh, maybe puts some people as I, as I was at ease, um, 
uh, how did you came up? There, there is a very strong beauty. There is like a very uh, precise, defined and uh, assertive uh, visual style of the film that I think it's it's very important that it's, uh, as I was saying before, uh, before the, the live started, make the film like a roller coaster in which uh, you are always in balance between uh, the the astonishment for the beauty and the greatness of the images and the, then the second thought is, oh my God. <laughs> so how did you came up or how did you work on this aspect? I think it's from my background in photography. I, I believe in aesthetics and in beauty and in terms of what they can do and how they can communicate and how they can affect us emotionally. So thinking of the work of someone like Sebastián Salgado mm -hmm. you know, as such difficult images, but they're so beautiful. And so that tension between looking at something that is horrific on the one hand and yet enticing because of the aesthetics, it interests me a lot to see like, well, how can you use form to kind of pull somebody into an experience that might otherwise be uh, repelling for them? So I was committed to using form <laughs> and aesthetics to talk about something difficult. And I also really wanted, this is the first film for me that's uh, set outside of Mexico. Um, everything else I had done till now was kind of very geographically based. So to think about something that is in my mind was kind of a non-geography in a lot of ways. And it's a global issue and not necessarily to frame it as a global issue all the time, but we're speaking in a much more abstract realm. Mm -hmm. So I was interested in a kind of um, essay, visual, visual essay, epic scale, and also seeing how the domestic space, which is often excluded from that world, can be part of it as well. Mm. Yeah, because there is a way, it's very astonishing also, there is a very different approach on the way you are filming your own kids and their environment and the other the outer space the the, the application of the te technology outside of the house how it was for you to approach your kids with a camera how was yeah i actually see find the right distance for it yeah i i i think of it very differently i actually think the approach is the same and mm. they look different but um for example what I fought against was I should film my kids all the time in my house with my little camera and make really intimate home movies of my children. <laughs> and then juxtapose that with these kind of epic images of the landscape and technology. I didn't want to do that. So the way that my kids are filmed is in the same formal controlled aesthetic language. Um, and I also, well, you know, they are my children and through their narration, you understand that they're my children, but also wanted you to think it could be any child in a lot of ways, right? They're not, it's not about them, hmm. right? It's not my personal everyday life with my kids. <laughs> it's not autobiographical in that way, mm -hmm. um, but it's so the children, my kids, I think in this sense are a little bit more um, symbols or of childhood and, and symbols that allow you to think about time passing and generations and things like that. I hope. Thank you. <laughs> I remember our audience that if they want, they can write questions exactly down the screen or if they want to ask something to Natalia. And otherwise I wanted to uh, ask you if you can, uh, talk a little bit about how you edited and how you came up with the narration, uh, with the text that you are, that it's accompanying us through the film. Yeah, so I edit the film. Um, and as I said, I kind of edit as I go. And uh, I wish I had like a, for myself, I wish I knew exactly how to do it. <laughs> it's just a process. <laughs> it's, I mean, there's a lot of thought and there's a lot of different structuring ideas. Um, but in this case, also, we were deciding what to film as we went. So the editing was informing what to shoot along the mm -hmm. way. And that was both content, like, oh, we haven't talked about AI or biotech or we're missing an idea. And it was also, you know, there are too many wide shots of landscapes and we need something intimate, right? Mm -hmm. We need to kind of create yeah, kind of a diverse vocabulary, visual vocabulary. Um, but all of that was 
becoming apparent through the editing process. And the narration, uh, I think I hesitated to have a narration for a long time. And the thing which convinced me to have it is that we decided to do a scene with this um, voice double, right? So it's a synthetic machine voice oh, yes. made yeah. out of my voice. Hmm. And I, when I did it, um, my Dave worked for this company, Descript, is um, doing some consulting work. And so we worked with the software at a very early stage when it still wasn't public. And it was crazy, like to go and make, you know, an hour maybe or an hour and a half of voice recording and then be able to type anything onto the computer and have it speak back in my voice such that sometimes I couldn't tell if it was me or the machine. It's just like, a, it's so weird. It's such a weird experience. Um, and I, I felt that in a lot of ways that was a kind of climax to the film where, you know, if you allow yourself to fantasize and kind of go into the science fiction world, you can imagine that for me, it was like, well, what if I die tomorrow, but my kids still have my voice and they can make me say whatever they want me to say and how will it feel for them? Like when they hear that, that machine voice, will they hear me or will they always hear a machine? And that idea just fascinates me, right? Because it's so, it's such our intimate relationship to technology, right? It's no longer technology over there and I can use it or not use it, but really thinking about who am I and, and what part of me is the mother and where does love get expressed? And if the machine says to my kids, I love you, what does that make them feel, right? And what would it make them feel once I'm gone? So all those questions just became so fascinating to me. And in order for that voice to work, I had to establish the mother character through the narration early, mm. right? So, and it, it helps also because a lot of things, especially in the tech world are invisible. And so you don't necessarily, I mean, it doesn't happen often, but occasionally you might not know what you're looking at. So it, it, it was a crutch sometimes to be able to have a voice at least orient you a little bit. Like there's some images of the ocean and it, they're just the ocean, right? But what, what can make you think maybe there's a fiber optic cable running underneath the water? Yeah, those were things I, I felt I needed to say. Yeah, it's I, I had the when uh, I saw the scene of the recording of the of the voice, I, I was suddenly uh, disoriented because I thought what I have heard so far, is it yeah. you or is it the machine? Yeah. Yeah. Well, this is, I think, a kind of uh, a reason to see the film in the movie theater <laughs> is that <laughs> the mix in we have a, a grant from Dolby. So it's an, we actually did an Atmos mix. We also have 5.1 surround sound. But in the space, we are able to differentiate a little bit more the two voices. Mm. Um, so they're very, very similar and they need to be because otherwise it wouldn't work. Uh, but I think in the theater space, it's a little bit more clear who's who. Um, yeah, maybe uh, the synthetic voice cannot fool Dolby. This is an interesting point. <laughs> it's more that we could choose where to place it. Yeah, okay. Place, okay. Right, so the great thing about working in the Atmos sound, which is what the whole film is this way, is that, or for example, give you one that's not the voice. With, with the Kronos Quartet, we recorded with 19 microphones. And they're, they're microphones that are attached, like very close to their instruments. So you can hear very, very intimate sound. And then there's mics that are up at the ceiling, kind of recording the whole space. So you, when you take that into the Atmos mix, we played a lot with where we place the sound. And you could mm -hmm. decide that the super intimate can actually go into the big um, speakers of the theater. And so you get the kind of bigness with the intimate. Right, and that is something when you translate into headphones, mm. and that's the best case scenario that people aren't watching just with their computer speakers. <laughs> um, you lose that ability to totally control or control as much the kind of sense of sonic scale and space. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Too technical. Absolutely. 
no it was not i mean uh, cinema is 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 this also <laughs> and um i wanted to ask you uh the film it's uh, the, the the presence of the screen it's uh, it's important in the film and uh, i wanted to tell you uh, you as a filmmaker uh, as a as a storyteller by by images uh, how when you are tracing when you're making this portrait of portrait of uh, this uh, this future world how do you see the storytelling through images and i'm not at all talking about uh, the the, the the industry or the market dynamics that everybody talks about, cinema close or cinema open. And just for you, what do you think that as a filmmaker that talks through images, what will be, what, how do you feel after all this research? Yeah. Um, personally, this was a, a very exciting project to make. Uh, it's for me, my first documentary that I'm not shooting. So I worked with a, my brother-in-law, Bennett Cerf, who's a cinematographer. And we were just able to work at a kind of more, not just with a bigger camera, but we were able to move it and think about different ideas. I had, I had just made a fiction film, which I think also took away any fears I might've had in terms of scale and possibility. And I, I would like to continue working this way, at least another film. But I think I teach sometimes uh, at university level and I've been surprised that I recently taught undergrads, so mm -hmm. early 20s. And I was surprised that their kind of visual um, sophistication and, and, and I was at a very good university was not that developed. So I was surprised to hear like a 20 year old who's grown up in this world that is so image based. And, and yet their ideas of like, well, if the camera moves then it feels more real than if it's static or like I don't think that you think like how could somebody really think that way today? Like how does a 20 year old today trust images when we know they can be so fabricated and uh, editing is so, everybody's editing and everybody's manufacturing their image on social media. So how is it possible that anybody believes any of it? <laughs> And it shocks me a little bit that there's not a kind of more advanced thinking in general about mm. the image. And I don't, I, I think of the image in, this, in what I'm saying uh, separate from story, right? Mm -hmm. we, we can use images in many different ways to tell stories, uh, but we can also use images to not tell stories, but we still have to understand how they work the same way we understand language, right? And, and we study how to make a sentence and how to make a paragraph and how to write an essay in school. Like even if you're not an English major or, <laughs> and I, I just don't understand how a kind of visual study is not integrated into a kind of core curriculum for people, for high school students and, and college students. I think we're at a very, uh, yeah, I, I, everybody's making images. We have to know how they work. Yeah, yeah, indeed. It's also because of the the possibility of interpreting them. and Exactly, yeah. So we need to know how to make them. We need to know how to read them. We need to know how to be conversant in images, whether we're filmmakers or not. And I would like just to come back to the, the question of the mixing uh, you were talking before. Uh, because the film has, I mean, beside this, uh, but the, the sound of the film, it's really inhabiting, it's, it's immersive. And uh, yeah. how did you work with this? I worked with, I'm sorry, the neighbors decided to vacuum or do something. Yeah, I was wondering, it's, it's a mixing, you know, it's a strange yeah. mixing. <laughs> um, so my, Dave, um, my husband and partner, uh, he, he did the sound design. And we work on the sound design from the very beginning. Uh, so, and he was also scoring on the computer from the beginning. So we start to kind of build the soundscape and the concepts behind the sound uh, throughout the whole process. And the idea was always to kind of play with what's real, what's not real, what's artificial sound, what's natural sound, um, to create an immersive experience to also, which the film does visually as well, is to kind of play with your sense of scale and, you know, what, as I was saying before, when is it intimate? When is it distant? Mm -hmm. When is it epic? When is it 
create a sense of vertigo, things like that. So, um, and again, with this Dolby grant, we were really lucky to get to work in Atmos and work with Laura Hirschberg, who mixed the film. And Laura Hirschberg is a Academy Award winning, incredible sound mixer. You know, it was an amazing experience. We got to work at Skywalker Sound, which is like a big sound place here in the States. And she's just amazing. Um, yeah. Yeah, this reminds us that I can tell to the people that are is watching now that if they are here around in Switzerland, they should definitely come for for the theater version. Yeah, I mean, I think every filmmaker thinks, "Oh, my film should be in a theater." <laughs> but it's, I mean, it's that this bring us back of what we are saying before. But this is the big screen is still. I think when you are making a movie, the the idea in the head of. Uh, and yes, the enjoyment of such a film, uh, in, in, it's different. It's, uh, yeah. It's, uh, yeah. Right. It's definitely, I mean, I, when we hesitated a bit about really like trying to start our festival circuit during COVID and, and I, you know, one, I felt like, well, as a filmmaker or as an artist, it's, it's not my job to wait. <laughs> it's our job to participate and respond and dialogue with the circumstances that we live in. Of course. So waiting didn't feel like an option for me. And then in that regard, and then I also thought, well, maybe it's like everybody is going through some time of like having to reckon with what technology is for them, whether it's because you're on Zoom all day for work or you... You know, even, even if we think like everybody's believed that there would be a cure or a, a, um, a vaccine. The question wasn't, how are we ever gonna solve this problem and what is it? Like it was technology and science that we all believe in would bring us a vaccine and get us through the pandemic, right? So we're all having to live out a relationship with technology very intimately. <laughs> and I think our dependence on it is very clear and so is, um, I think perhaps we can see where it fails us as well. Like, it is not the same to be here on Zoom with you as it would have been had I been able to be there in person. The conversation- feel better than not being at all but talking. Than exactly. Right? And, <laughs> yeah. and living with that ambiguity and that duality and contradictions is something I think everybody is experiencing right now. <laughs> yeah, and I think that the film, it's, it's really talking uh, very precisely about it. It's right. in the questioning you are doing, but not only with the kids, because there are images that are, as I would say, frightening, but they are also uh, like waking up, uh, like images of, of the future. And we all know that we don't have many, 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 many choices. And that, uh, yeah. for example, there is the images of the um, greenhouse. Yeah. And at the same time, from one side, you are scared because they say, oh my God, what, 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 what is this? How, how this is possible? And what am I eating after all? But then you think, ah, okay. So there is still a way to produce, to produce food, even if things were gonna be like, not so good. <laughs> in For me, that was, that was amazing experience because my I family imagine. in ranching. So my father, my family had a farm in Mexico. Mm -hmm. And I always think of myself as coming from an agriculture family. But of course it was like in a field with workers. Yes, of course. A, di a different, different thing. And, and to be in that space that is also very loud, mm. which is so different. Like we think of a garden as a peaceful, quiet place. And I hadn't thought about the sonic experience of being in the vertical farm. <laughs> and it's incredibly loud and incredibly controlled. And it's exactly what you said, like you think, okay, this is not, you know, food from the land and the soil and the sun anymore. And yet it may be our only hope, right? And, and it's solving a lot of problems like that. The place we filmed this in New Jersey, right by Newark airport, right outside of New York City. So you reduce transport, you, you use the urban space that is no longer used for what it was. Like it has so many benefits. And then you also, for me, you know, I often think of my, my grandfather built um, irrigation systems and, and you kind of think of, they had this idea that anytime they brought water into a landscape, it was a good thing. 
turning anything desert green was a good thing. Uh, pesticides that could produce more food was a good thing, right? So we have to have a little bit of humility and kind of, of perspective and say like, we don't know. And are those vegetables that are grown without sunlight and soil, are they gonna be okay long-term? We don't know, right? And all we can do is try and believe in science, but I think we have to always also have that kind of humility to say, we just don't know. We just have to keep asking and researching and investigating and thinking about it. And I think the, um, yeah. Wow, that's a food for thought. <laughs> yeah, yeah, literally. Yes. <laughs> Well, thank you very much, uh, you. Natalia Almada, for being with us. I just remember once again that Users is available for 72 hours uh, on our website and that our talk uh, will, be, will be on uh, on the website also. And I say it again, if you're around in Yon, come to see me. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. <laughs>